The Most Mysterious Deaths in the Bible Number 1. Lot's Wife There is a woman that Jesus referenced in Luke. Remember Lot's wife. Luke 17 verse 32 Lot's wife is an unnamed woman mentioned in the Bible very few times. She is a woman who met an untimely end due to her disobedience of the word of the Lord. In the book of Genesis, we have more information about the story of Lot's wife's death than anything else about her. In chapter 13, Abram, along with his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, left Egypt with their wealth. Conflict develops between Abram's and Lot's shepherds. Abram did not want any hard feelings, so he made a proposal to Lot. Lot surveyed the land and decided to settle in the Jordan plain due to its abundant water supply. He set up his tent facing Sodom while Abram chose to live in Canaan. The Bible states in verse 13 that the people of Sodom were exceedingly wicked sinners in the eyes of the Lord. Lot was accompanied by his wife on this journey. Up until this point, Abram and Lot had been working together. It's possible that Lot was originally viewed as Abram's heir. However, due to a dispute between Abram and Lot's herdsmen, Lot moves out of Abram's circle. He moves out of the land of promise to the cities of the plain, which were inhabited by great sinners. He thought he was making progress, but his decision led to his downfall, as these cities were destined for destruction. When Abraham and Sarah, as they were known at the time, were getting older, the Lord informed Abraham about the increasing evil and impending wrath of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was sitting at the entrance of Sodom when two angels approached him. Lot agreed to offer them accommodation, but the angels refused and wanted to spend the night outside. Eventually, they agreed to stay with Lot, who then provided them with food. That night, all the men of Sodom found out about the angels' presence and surrounded Lot's house, demanding that the angels be handed over to them. However, Lot instead offered his two daughters to the men of Sodom. Despite this, the men of Sodom continued their efforts to reach the angels, who they thought were just men. The angels locked Lot inside his house and locked the door. Then, they struck the men outside with blindness, making it difficult for them to locate the door. The angels instructed Lot to gather his family and leave Sodom as soon as possible. Lot forewarned his sons-in-law. As daylight approached, the angels reminded Lot that judgment was imminent and that he needed to remove his wife and daughters from the city. Lot and his family flee Sodom. Flee for your lives, one of the angels exclaimed as they fled the city. Do not look back or halt anywhere in the plain. Get to the mountains or you'll be washed away. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah and overthrew those towns and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and all that grew on the ground. As the cities were being demolished, Genesis 19, 26, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. According to Bible interpretations, Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt for looking back, for breaking the instruction not to look back. Her actions indicate that she sympathized with the people of Sodom, and her failure to evade God's wrath serves as a stark warning to others. Lot's wife had every opportunity to live. Although Lot's wife is not named in the Bible, we can assume certain things about her based on the context. It is likely that she was familiar with the God whom Lot served, and she had Abraham which might have allowed her to learn a lot from him. She could have even been present when her husband was kidnapped by Kedalioma and saved by God's strength. Additionally, she was exceedingly blessed to have God's angels in her home, who even took her by the hand and led her out of Sodom. But what good did all that do her in the end? All of God's grace was wasted on her. There are several key takeaways here. You can leave the world and begin on the correct path, but you will be eternally lost if you turn back. You are in charge of your own beliefs. 
But why did God care if she glanced over her shoulder at Sodom? There are two key points to consider regarding the act of looking back. Firstly, looking back is an indication of doubt. God had spoken and he would carry out his promise. We may declare that we believe in God, but when tested, we often waver and look back. Therefore, God invites us to put our trust in him and turn our attention to spiritual matters. Secondly, looking back is an act of disobedience. God had clearly instructed not to look back and to go to the mountains without looking back. There was no time allotted to hear any excuses or reasons for disobeying. Sodom. Was she displaying a love for what she was leaving behind? Her body was leaving, but her heart was still in Sodom. Luke 17 verses 26 to 30, New American Standard Bible. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, and they were building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Do we want to be friends with the rest of the world? This world represents everything that is opposed to God, the wickedness that was once part of your life. Lessons from Lot's wife's punishment. Lot's wife's punishment was terrible, abrupt, and irreversible. She was denied another chance to flee when she looked back. All mercy that had previously been extended was abruptly withdrawn. The Bible does not go into detail about what happens, and it is exposed as a natural result of her decision. Number 2. Eaten Alive by Worms Herod the Great was considered king of the Jews during the time that Jesus was born, and he attempted to have Jesus slain. During the time that John the Baptist and Jesus were ministering, Herod Antipas was ruling as king. Antipas had John executed. Acts 4 verse 27 makes reference to Herod Antipas, who is referred to simply as Herod, as one of the individuals responsible for the execution of Jesus. Because Judea was a client state of Rome, the Judean king's primary responsibility was to maintain peace. It was in Caesarea that Herod Agrippa I met his demise. Agrippa had been fighting with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now band together and sought a meeting with him. They made their request for peace since they were reliant on the king's nation for their means of survival. On the appointed day, Herod delivered a public address to the people. Acts 12 verses 21 to 23, Amplified Bible. On an appointed day, Herod dressed himself in his royal robes, sat on his throne, tribunal, rostrum, and began delivering a speech to the people. The assembled people kept shouting, it is the voice of God and not of man. And at once an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and instead permitted himself to be worshipped, and he was eaten by worms and died five days later. It is in the nature of humans to search for political deliverers, and the people of Tyre and Sidon appeared to worship Herod as if he were a god because of this. Herod, on the other hand, seemed to take great pleasure in it and focused all of the praise on himself rather than on God. It was fitting that Herod passed away in the manner that he did because of the spiritual state he was in. He was corrupted from the inside out. Josephus, an ancient Jewish historian, also provided a graphic description of the manner in which Herod passed away. The evidence that Luke provides leads one to believe that Agrippa was suddenly overcome by worms that consumed him in a matter of seconds, and one can see how this may be depicted in a Hollywood movie in a terrible way. Luke, on the other hand, does not indicate that Herod passed away right away. Rather, 
he says that Herod was struck down instantly. According to what is written in the Book of Acts, the worms, which were more likely parasites that caused the death, were sent by God himself. It is important to remember that it is never worth it to go to war against God. Psalm 1 verses 5 to 6, Amplified Bible. Therefore the wicked will not stand unpunished in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows and fully approves the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Peter, one of the apostles, was free to spread the gospel and serve the Lord. Meanwhile, Herod the king suffered from worms in his digestive tract and was in great pain on his bed. Eventually, Herod passed away, but the word of God continued to spread and thrive. Number 3. Moses, the man that God buried. God has chosen to withhold such information about the events preceding Moses' death from us. The mere mention of the name Moses arouses different images in the minds of various folks. In the Bible, Moses' death is shrouded in mystery. He died at the age of 120, but his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Moses was still in his prime when he was called home despite his age. Moses was barred from entering the Promised Land because of his disobedience at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. He led the Israelites to the very edge of Canaan and was given a glimpse of the land, but he was not permitted to enter it. Mount Pisgah has a summit elevation of 4,500 feet, and that's nearly a mile. There aren't many 120-year-old men who can climb a mountain nearly a mile high and live to tell the tale. Moses could take each step on the slope in stride with lightened shoulders. He was well aware that he was about to take his final breath at any moment. When it comes to the subject of death, Moses teaches us that a believer has no reason to be afraid or to rush into the streets in a panicked state. Death is an inescapable part of reality for each and every one of us. Before we are truly prepared to live, we must first be prepared to pass away. Therefore, when we are ready to pass away, let us not delay and immediately do it. As Moses took in this final visual feast of the Promised Land, a piece of real estate that he would never step foot upon, this is what he was looking forward to the most. And that was it. God wanted him home. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Moses gave up the spirit. Whether we are heroes or not, we will all reach the point in our lives when we must abandon the body and pass on to another realm. Two different messages spring from this. The aloneness of death. Not its loneliness, but its aloneness. There's a difference. Loneliness suggests an empty longing, reaching in vain for someone else. Aloneness means nobody else goes along. That is what I see here. It's a solo flight. You never take a companion along with you to travel through death. You go all alone. On the other hand, Moses is all by himself atop Mount Pisgah. Joshua was not allowed to accompany them in any way, and Aaron had long since disappeared. On the rocky trek to the peak where there was no discernible trail, there was just one solitary figure to be seen. The next thing that springs up is the security of death. Moses died, according to the word of the Lord. The man's life came to an end precisely how God had planned it out all along. Moses passed away by himself, but in peace. The account of his passing is contained within the final six verses of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. Death has a way of putting things into proper perspective, doesn't it? After a death comes a burial, and so it was in the case of Moses. 
But verse 6 contains one of the most remarkable statements about the whole remarkable career of Moses. Deuteronomy 34 verse 6, Amplified Bible. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, and no man knows where his burial place is to this day. Moses is the only person in the Bible whom God personally buried. Did you realize that? The Lord then hid the tomb. What made him do that? Because that grave would have been turned into a shrine. They'd still be beating a path up Nebo today, erecting shrines, selling popcorn and peanuts, offering various rides and maybe even running a tram up there with big banners proclaiming Moses' burial place. So it was concealed. This is so crucial to the Lord that it even sparked an angelic confrontation. Jude 9 contains one of the stranger accounts in the Bible concerning this event. Jude writes, Jude 9, New American Standard Bible. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The end of the story. All things have their proper wrap-up, as does the story of Moses. Since that time, there has not been another prophet who has arisen in Israel who is comparable to Moses, whom the Lord personally knew. This is due to all of the miracles and signs that the Lord commanded Moses to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all of his servants, and the entirety of Pharaoh's land as well as due to all the great terror and mighty power that Moses displayed in front of all of Israel. Famous French historian and philologist Joseph Renan once said of Moses, he is a colossus among figures of humanity. Moses was clearly one of a kind, but at the end of the day, he was just a man serving God. Nonetheless, we can derive a great deal of personal gain from learning about his life and passing. Number 4. Enoch Enoch was a man who had great intimacy with God. Intimacy is such a simple word that can explain so much. It represents the closeness, affinity, and heart-to-heart -heart companionship we have with another individual. The Bible is full of people who have stood in this place of fellowship and communion with the Lord. From the Old Covenant and even before, the Spirit was freely given to empower people to obey the Lord. One such example of that kind of deep, intimate relationship with the Lord even resulted in a supernatural occurrence. The book of Genesis gives us the account of a man named Enoch. Genesis 5 verse 24, New American Standard Bible. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The scriptures also record two other simple verses about him. Hebrews 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for before he was taken up, he was attested to have been pleasing to God. The Bible does not disclose what happened at the point God took him, or even after. Still, he must have followed with the same intensity of faith that Abraham showed when he was heading to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, believing that he would receive him back again. It also may have been the same intensity of faith with which Elijah followed God until the chariots of fire swept him off the earth in a blaze of glory. Enoch leaves us with an understanding that can be the possibility for every believer for God is not a respecter of persons. Anyone who desires and is willing to pay the cost can equally experience great depths with God. The end result of Enoch's life of deep and passionate walk with God was an encounter that was strange but marvelous. He became the first partaker in some sort of rapture. No wonder the scriptures say that God is ready to accomplish supernatural feats for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 But, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love him. 
close fellowship with the Creator of heaven and earth is a privilege. It looks a lot like reading tomorrow's news today, as he continually unveils mysteries and gives insight to those who follow passionately and walk closely with him. It is these revelations that give us an advantage, enabling us to take steps to avoid any scheme the enemy may have planned for us. Ultimately, walking closely with him gives God joy. God has given us the best of himself and desires fellowship with us, not just for himself, but because it is only when we are in a close relationship with him that the full potential he placed within us can be fully realized. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father, we come before you with hearts heavy with the weight of mortality, seeking your guidance and comfort as we contemplate the concept of proper death. In a world filled with uncertainty and fear, grant us the assurance of your presence and the hope of eternal life in you. Help us to understand that proper death does not necessarily mean a life free from pain or suffering, but rather a departure from this earthly existence in accordance with your divine will. Grant us the grace to accept the natural order of life and death, knowing that you hold the keys to eternity in your hands. Teach us, O Lord, to treasure each moment that you have given us, recognizing the precious gift of life and the opportunity to make a difference in the world around us. Help us to live with purpose and meaning, knowing that our time on earth is but a fleeting moment in the grand scheme of your eternal plan. As we contemplate the inevitability of death, grant us the courage to face our own mortality with faith and confidence in your promises. Help us to trust in your goodness and mercy, knowing that you are always with us, even in the darkest moments of life. Guide us, O Lord, in our journey towards proper death, that we may approach the end of our earthly pilgrimage with grace and dignity. Grant us the strength to let go of our earthly attachments and to surrender ourselves fully in your loving embrace. Help us find comfort in the knowledge that death is not the end, but rather the beginning of a new and glorious chapter in your eternal kingdom. Grant us the hope of resurrection and the promise of eternal life in your presence. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may your rod and your staff comfort us, guiding us safely into your heavenly kingdom. Help us to find peace in knowing that you are preparing a place for us where there will be no more pain or sorrow, but only joy and everlasting life. Grant us the courage to face death with faith and confidence, knowing that you have conquered sin and death through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross for the sake of our salvation. As we journey towards proper death, may your love surround us and your grace sustain us until we are called home to dwell with you forever. We offer this prayer with hearts full of gratitude and hope, trusting in your unfailing love and mercy. Amen. Our question of the day, what is your favorite worship song? Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from us and be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to find out about our latest videos.